Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Well, it's wonderful to be here again. We're, uh, is it old for you already, being in in-person events? <laughs> it's like a normal thing you're ever, all, everyone's doing. I'm like, I'm looking around and I'm not looking at Zoom screens. It's like there's, there's flesh everywhere I turn. It's great. <laughs> it's wonderful to be back. Um, my last time at the Commonwealth Club was with my book. And oh. so I am completely delighted and honored to be here for your book. As I was just introduced, my name is Arthi Shahani. I'm a longtime journalist, author, and podcaster. I host a podcast called Art of Power. And in the podcast, I talk to extraordinary humans who have managed to move the needle in the world. That is incredibly, incredibly hard to do. Um, some of my guests have included President Barack Obama, democracy activist Stacey Abrams, Peloton's Robin Arzone, what a beast. <laughs> and I'm thinking of tonight's conversation pretty much as an art of power conversation that I would have with two of who I consider to be two of the boldest people in a 100 mile radius. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm really not like um, saying that lightly. I think that Mitch and Frida are independently and together this force of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I watch with curiosity, um, sometimes from a distance, sometimes I, I reach out to get your take on an event mm -hmm. or something that's unfolded that I might need to report on or write about or whatnot. I look to them as true experts who will be honest brokers in conversations. And a fun fact you don't know is when I first met the both of you, I was completely disappointed. <laughs> and it's because... Sorry. Yeah, well, it's actually, it's not your fault, and it's ironically because of your skin color. I thought Kapoor was Kapoor. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I guess you don't need to be Indian to understand that joke. <laughs> and so I was brand new to the Bay Area. I'm originally from Queens, New York, my hometown. Ha! Huh? So, yeah! <laughs> Woo! Show some love. <laughs> My hometown is, I think, a working class version of the Cape War Center in Oakland. And we'll talk later about how much the home base they've built reminds me of the actual home I grew up in. Hmm. But before seeing that place and when just Googling them and being brand new to the Bay Area, I was so excited because I'd heard so much about Cape Or, Cape Or, Cape Or, I thought Kapoor, 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 uh, <laughs> read so much about them. And I just was so excited to meet some people of color leadership. <laughs> but over the years, I have come to really appreciate so much of how you operate, the bold moves you make to leave the institutions you build, to figure out how to pass on leadership, um, to speak out at moments it's not comfortable. We're gonna get into some of those. Um, and what I'd like to do to start off with is you know, a question and a reflection about your book, and the book, by the way, it's called Closing the Equity Gap, Creating Wealth and Fostering Justice in Startup Investing. I guess I should stop to formally say thank you for coming to the Commonwealth Club and speaking with us tonight. <laughs> so, show some love. To tell quite a few people in the audience know you guys and are getting their hugs and autographs. So here's what I loved about the book. Um, for me, a good book is entertaining, and a great book, when you read it, helps you to reread the world. Hmm. You actually will then start to see the things around you differently. And I have, for my decade here, had the sense that certain things that we take to be true don't quite sit well, but I didn't know why. I didn't know how to explain it. And in reading your book, I was like, oh, that's why. So interesting. So let's start with one example of that. Here is a huge truism in Silicon Valley. The way that you make insane amounts of money as a venture capitalist is you place bets on many, many, many startups and you let most of them fail horrific deaths and you just hope 
and push for one of them to make an insane amount of money. That's how it goes. That's the story of wealth creation in VC culture. And I remember hearing that story and never ever questioning it. And as a journalist, the, the, the main job of a journalist, our core competency is to kind of call out the emperor's clothes, right? Like we just, we're supposed to ask the same questions. And I never thought to ask, isn't that cruel? <laughs> <laughs> Does it have to be that way? Is it really mm -hmm. the only way? Mm -hmm. And in your book, you basically say, it's cruel and it doesn't have to be that way. So explain. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the reasons the outcomes are so extreme, as you describe, is that many venture capitalists push companies to either go big or to fail. And they push and push and push and push against oftentimes the interests of the founders who can have a nice business and a profitable business. But if it doesn't look like it's going to get big enough, fast enough, that's not good enough. And so the VCs drive a lot of companies into failure that don't have to fail because of that mentality. And there's a, you know, lots of VCs say we're founder friendly, but only up to a point. And because if anything gets in the way of getting that really big outcome, they will throw the founder overboard in, in a heartbeat. And we think there's a different approach that works. And we talk about what our idea was. And, and do you want to give that part about? I could tell you were waiting to pass the baton. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, let me say one, one other thing about that. The model doesn't make any sense unless all you are interested in is what I often refer to as greed first investing or greed only investing. Because a whole lot of lives are destroyed, a whole lot of value is destroyed, a whole lot of companies that could do a whole lot of good are just decimated. And unfortunately, we are about to see a whole lot more of that given the current economic climate. Venture capitalists have start, stopped writing checks. Not us, but most have stopped writing checks. What does that mean? If you haven't figured out to be, how to be profitable on the money you've already raised, you are going under because they're not gonna write you another check. And those conversations are happening every single day. Now, mind you, these are the venture capitalists who told you profitability doesn't matter, revenues hardly matter, all that matters is growth. That's what they told you a year ago. Hmm. So it's this constant moving of the goalposts. Hmm. And where Mitch handed it over to you, though, uh -huh. just then explain. I mean, that's a really, it's a really humanistic explanation for what's wrong. And then the, the cynic would say, okay, that's nice, but people want to make money. Mm -hmm. Well, and you. The, we do. Yeah. We, we, we want to make money and we do make money and we do it in a completely different model. We do it where the core business, and we have some of our exemplary entrepreneurs in the room, some just coming in, um, <laughs> and uh, the core businesses in the Cape or Capital portfolio, the purpose of the business closes gaps of access, opportunity, or outcome for communities of color and or low-income communities. It's not a side thing. It's not a thing you do once you make money and start a charity. It's not a Tom Shoe model where we're going to give one away, you know, to somebody who needs something until things aren't so good anymore and then we'll stop giving one away. It's the core purpose of the business to close gaps. Mm -hmm. The experiment we conducted was whether it was possible to invest on that basis mm -hmm. of creating, looking for companies that create social value and economic value at the same time by closing gaps mm -hmm. and do it in a way that wasn't what's called concessionary, doing it in a way that didn't sacrifice returns. Mm -hmm. And in fact, over a decade and 140 companies, our returns were in the top quartile, the top 25% compared with all venture funds mm -hmm. of, that, of, of our size, regardless of their investment thesis. So that's data that 
you ignore at your peril that yeah. an alternative model is in fact possible. Yeah, you know, when I read that fact in the book, that's where I was like, see, money talks, <laughs> right? And your investment thesis, many would write off as like some touchy-feely nonprofit spiel. Mm -hmm. and you're like, no, this is actually a winning strategy. Diversity is actually a winning strategy. And I found that fascinating, I really did. Mitch, you were not totally sold on this at first. And I have heard you say, admitting that um, Frida convinced you, and you also said she is convincing. <laughs> And I wanted to know how she convinced you. <laughs> well, Frida could be very persuasive. She nudged me. Like, I want a story. I want details. Like, one night we were having wine, and we got into a fight. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we both work together and live together. We're a married couple, so this spontaneously gives rise to opportunities at the dinner table and at other times to talk about what's going on. And she would... In fact, this goes back even further, back to Lotus. Back in the day, this software company that I started in the 80s, Frida's job description, make Lotus the most progressive employer in the US, mm -hmm. which, which she did. Mm -hmm. But she also, early on, would pull me aside and say, you know, when you did this thing, you're probably not aware of it, but it had a bad impact. Like, you may just have been self-absorbed in your own thoughts when you were walking down the hall, but you ignored these three vice presidents <laughs> totally when they went and said hello. And now they're all scared they're going to lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. So she really held me accountable to understand the impact of my own behavior first. And then, if you fast forward decades later, I was doing a lot of angel investing, and some of those, I'd done angel investing, been early on in the internet, early on in streaming media, and she said, what about if you thought about investing in a way that was more aligned with your values? I know what your values are, hmm. but you're not taking it into account when you're doing things. And I, I thought, oh, I'm going to lose out on all the big deals if I do this. <laughs> so I totally understand when entrepreneurs start that way. But she can be very persuasive. And also, she's very often right. <laughs> Not 100%, but I have learned. <laughs> and so I listened and decided to give it a try. Hmm. Be, be empirical. Mm -hmm. Over time, over, over decades, time. it sounds like. Yeah. Well, the first couple of years were we were finding our way in the dark because nobody had done this before and we centered around the idea of gap closing mm -hmm. and then we needed to figure out what that meant what does it mean in education what does it mean in fintech what does it mean in in in, in health what gaps for whom mm -hmm. and we developed a, you know an investing discipline uh, around that and it was working mm -hmm. right You've both used the terms gap closing, gap widening. Mm -hmm. And there's a specific example you give in the book that I want to start with this part of the conversation. A female founder comes up to you, and she wants funding for a startup, which is going to charge $300 an hour to do college counseling. There's definitely market demand for that. I mean, I think all of us know people who would pay that kind of money to get their kids into the best schools. But you guys say, no, you're not interested in funding that kind of thing. It's a female founder, so why not? Gap widening. Because when that business succeeds, you make it much harder for low-income kids to get in. What you've done is gamed the system. You've bought your way to cut in line. None of those are things that that we feel good about. None of those are things that we think are values upon which companies or countries ought to be built. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we have, um, a, I almost said kick-ass. Am I allowed to say that? I think yeah. you are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a kick-ass ed tech company. No, it's FCC regulated. <laughs> that, <yeah. Okay. laughs> uh, called Numerade that does tutoring. Guess what they charge? eight dollars a month all you can eat hmm. so wow. and they are a very successful business making lots of money if you th you know what we say to people is go back and think this through if you can come up with a way that your business is gap 
closing instead of gap widening, we believe in tutoring. So go back and think about it. A few companies have actually redone their businesses and come back and we've written checks. Most go away cursing. It surprises me that a few companies have redone it and come back to you and you've given money because wouldn't you be concerned they're just trying to hustle you for the money? <laughs> well, they've got a business model. They've got a business plan that they figured out how to do it. Right. And w certainly we look at the business model a lot. Is it gap closing? But we also look at the founder or the founding team mm -hmm. a lot and their character and ask ourselves and ask them, why are you doing this? Is this just some way you think you're going to build a big business or is it somehow authentic because it comes out of your own lived experience in some fashion? Something that happened to you early on that might have been scarring and you're now thinking, I'm going to help solve this problem so other people don't have that experience. So if we don't see that, if we don't see real commitment, mm -hmm. uh, we're, not going to, doesn't, we're not going to invest even if the business model makes sense on paper. And the reason is every business model changes. It always changes, especially when people come in early and uh, we're doing pre-seed investing or seed. It's just sometimes an idea. You know, uh, it's a PowerPoint and, and, and a founder. And so what doesn't change is the, the determination and the, the, the persistence and the resilience of the founder. Mm -hmm. So we give a lot of weight to that. And we've learned to do that because painfully we did not do that and that's where some of our biggest mistakes were early on. Mm, losing people at moments of pivoting or what? What do you mean? People turned out not to be serious about what they said they were going to do and when times got tough they just, they themselves, you know, flew off in the opposite direction or something that we never would have put money into in the first place. Such an interesting kind of leadership assessment. Like as I hear it, what you're basically saying, what you've written about in the book is that it, and tell me if this is incorrect. It sounds like you're assessing a p prospective leader's deepest personal trauma and making sure it aligns with the professional ambitions they're setting out. And that alignment is a sweet spot. What I would say, if I could annotate that, is yeah. sometimes a person's deepest commitment comes out of trauma. Uh -huh. It doesn't always, it doesn't have to, but we want to know where it comes from. We really want to know that it's genuine. We want to see what they have done to date that has led up to this moment to make them who they are and why they want to undertake this. Yeah. No, I, you know, I said it that way and maybe being a little stylized about it because it's actually a very empowering perspective, right? Because so often you're taught to be ashamed of that thing that broke you. And now you've got, you know, leading investors in the top quartile saying, no, no, that can be a good thing. It's a, it, yeah. It's strong in the broken places. What do you mean? You said it's strong in the broken places? Yeah, I mean, we've had, you know, famous <laughs> authors and poets have talked about being strong in the broken places and that when you come back resilient. Mm -hmm. um, and it isn't, it's really, we want to know that their lived experience gave them their insight. The insight about the problem, the obstacle they faced, and the insight about how to fix it and how to fix it for others. Mm -hmm. Because our founders are, and many are in the room, are deeply empathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not what you find at your standard issue Silicon Valley startup founder. Ours are the wildly liability different. by many. <laughs> right, right. You know, and this is another thing that, uh, as I explained, reading your book helps me reread moments. I remember when moving here a decade ago and then hearing this kind of like the trope of they made it in their parents' garage, that thing you keep hearing. And I remember when I first came here and I kept being told this like amazing story of creation and hustle in the parents' garage, I kept thinking their parents had a garage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I grew up poor. <laughs> and so for me, mm -hmm. I was like, what are you talking about? There was so much privilege to begin with. You went to robotics camp, what? Yeah. And so you guys introduce this alternative. We just talked a little bit about gap widening, but this notion of distance traveled. So when you look at a resume, often when you look at a resume, when you look at someone's LinkedIn, what are you looking at on LinkedIn? The fancy pedigree, the job titles. You don't look, you don't, you won't gauge from LinkedIn, where did you start? 
And I know now, having done Art of Power and when I do these leadership interviews, I'm always so curious about where did you start? Because what I observe is when you grow up in a comfortable middle class, just stable middle class environment, the ways you can leap compared to someone who grows up poor, it's just, you know, categorically different. The, uh, so just talk a little bit about this, this metric that you use of distance traveled, which is not reflected in like a LinkedIn resume. Well, it's something that I discovered decades ago, and it was a lot in working with a scholarship program that I co-founded and, and at UC Berkeley after Prop 209 was passed. Prop 209 killed affirmative action in public institutions in California in 96. Um, I'm, we'll, we probably are used to what we're going to all see nationally in June, but we'll we'll see. Um, and this was a race conscious scholarship program on campus at Berkeley after the students were admitted race blind. And so it was so apparent from the students of color who were from low income backgrounds, the distance they had traveled to get to the doorstep of UC Berkeley to get admitted, um, and that none of that was what was usually counted. And when you say, I mean, what? Their parents had a garage? So early on, and when I was one of the volunteer readers for UC Berkeley, um, one of the things that we asked for is on a cover sheet, it would say the number of AP classes and I, they had taken. Mm. And I said, I want the denominator. I want to know how many AP classes were offered at their high school. Mm. Because if you show me two applications, both of whom took four AP classes, and one went to a Title I low-income public school, and they offered four AP classes, that's a really different story than somebody who went to some, you know, fancy prep school that offered 32 AP classes and all kinds of, you know, so if you took four out of 32, you're lazy. And I don't want you <laughs> in my school, right? So there are different ways to look at the same data of four AP classes. And I want to know the context in which somebody made those choices. Mm -hmm. So understanding the hurdles, the barriers that people have already overcome uh, going under their own speed from where they started, that distance traveled measure, and all credit to Frida for identifying it, turns out just to be very, very useful because it's an indicator of, of, of persistence and, and, mm -hmm. and, and grit and factors that are one of some of the factors that really make a difference about successful founders. Right. Not the only one. No, 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 no. But is there something you're thinking when you made that strong caveat? No, we're talking in, 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 in strong language, and um, which is great. But I'm just thinking that when it actually comes to making investment decisions, the reason we don't have algorithms for it today, and I don't expect we're going to have algorithms anytime soon, is it requires good human judgment. Because you have to know which questions are the important ones. Is it the total addressable market? Is it the competition? Mm. Is it their technical skills? Is it the distance traveled of the founder? You've got 16 different things all in, in play all at once. And good investors are ones who learn how to ask the right questions, right. probably like good journalists. Right, right. At the right time. At the right and time. And so, I mean, I think that it's just that you're, you're introducing then metrics and questions and dimensions that weren't part of the traditional thinking. <laughs> right. Not to throw out the others. Good engineering does matter. We're going to get to Health Sherpa in a moment. Um, in distance <laughs> travel, let's talk a little bit about who heads the Cape War Center. You know, I will say, maybe because I'm a woman, I'm particularly interested. You have two folks who are heading what has now become one of the largest black led venture capital funds in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them is a woman by the name of Ulili Onavakpuri. Mm -hmm. And I'm just completely taken by how your relationship evolved. So just describe a little bit your meet cute with her and how that evolved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, Ulili, uh, like Candace sitting in the front row, who's our senior director of comms, um, like Patrick Armstrong, who's in New York, we have three people who are working in various entities who were in that scholarship program at UC Berkeley that I described. So I've known Ulili since she was a high school senior uh, and designing her own major at Berkeley. Uh, and after graduating from Cal, uh, we hired her 
into the nonprofit side of things. It was then the Level Playing Field Institute, now SMASH. Um, and then so he <laughs> stole her. <laughs> she had much younger brothers, and she was tutoring them in math. We knew this because we were a kid-friendly, dog-friendly office, and so I would mm -hmm. see them together. And we happened to be on the Cape Capital side taking a pitch from a startup that was doing uh, iPhone, an iPhone app for uh, math for elementary school students. So I said, well, Lily, why don't you sit in on the meeting? I wanted to get the user perspective on this. And I thought it would, and it turned out in that meeting, she asked much better questions than I did or than anybody on the investment team because she was in the mix. She knew she was using this stuff to try to help her. And I, afterwards I said to Frida, I got to get some more of her time. Can I steal some of her time? And we negotiated around this, and she uh, started working half time. And then that wasn't enough. I was a little greedy, and I said, "No, we need to make this full time." And Ulili had never even heard of venture capital, much less considered a career in it. But she was so like most humans. She was <laughs> like most humans. She was really taken by the work and the, and, and the opportunity. And she went on her own course and went to a, a business school uh, and then went to work for a couple of other venture firms and then came back to us and uh, became a partner after several years and is now the co-managing partner of, of Cape War Capital. She uh, heads the healthcare practice the, and the, the, the people ops, uh, you know, what used to be called HR. Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I did not, I've met her before and I did not realize that background and I was like, look at that, yeah. Jerry. But another thing about Ulili is she, because of her experience in the scholarship program, yeah. she came to me and said, can I start a summer associates program at Cape War Capital? And I said, sure, what a great idea. And the first person who came in as a summer associate is Brian Dixon, who is now her co-managing partner. So it's our first summer associate and somebody who accidentally yeah. fell into venture capital. And she, the accidental part, we intentionally, we did it when we were in San Francisco, we do it at the Cape War Center in Oakland. We have nonprofit folks and foundation folks and venture capitalists all meeting with each other, all interacting, all having lunch together intentionally because these kinds of connections don't happen any other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, we talk a lot about the fact that there's a lot of overlooked talent in the world. We invest in overlooked talent, but if you don't give people an opportunity, you don't know what they can do. If you have an environment that fosters those opportunities, it is just amazing. And the most unlikely people, this is from a conventional point of view, will just completely, you know, bowl you over with their, mm -hmm. with what they do. Mm -hmm. Do you each consider yourself an insider or an outsider? Both. <laughs> Explain a little. It, well, mostly an outsider. It's fighting time. <laughs> <laughs> um, mostly an outsider. Um, when we are insiders is when it, it's very interesting that the mainstream Silicon Valley venture capital firms have said no often multiple times to many of our founders. But magically when they hit their series b and they're profitable and it turns out they really are rocket ships all of a sudden we're insiders hey remember me um the one who wanted nothing to do with your ideas about diversity actually i got an email from a very well-known vc about a year ago that starts out dear frida i'm that idiot I didn't call him that, but I, it was an apt description. To his face. Uh, I'm <laughs> that idiot who told you I was colorblind at that Ooh. Google for Startups, um, looking at Mr. Google for Startups over there, at the Google for Startups meetup 10 years ago. So what possessed him to have a light bulb moment, let alone write me? I mean, that's a brave thing to do. You have to, I mean, we want... We want everybody, if they have to think about that they're colorblind and that that's a good thing, we want them to get over it much more quickly than 10 years. But um, at any rate, he wanted, he was fighting desperately 
to lead a very big Series B round in a company with a black founder that we had been in since the seed stage. So all of a sudden, hmm. it mattered, his perspective on diversity and his friendliness to a black founder. Mm -hmm. can, can I give my answer on the insider-outsider yes. thing? Yeah. The seminal event in my childhood is my parents had me skipped out of second grade because the work was, I, I could do the work, but I was, and I was already a year younger than everybody because of my, when my birthday fell in the year. And so I was always like almost two years younger than everybody in school. I was an outsider's outsider growing up, core part of my identity. So even when, um, and in fact, that's why we hired Frida at Lotus. Her job description, this is this, when we were doing spreadsheets in, Make in the 80s. Make it the most progressive company. Make <laughs> Lotus the most progressive, because I wanted it to be the kind of place where somebody who was a misfit, and I felt I was a misfit, mm. you know, could be themselves and could be valued for what they contributed and, you know, would be, would be included. I think all that actually had the effect on me that at the point at which I became an insider to anyway to the personal computer industry and to tech and so on, it was hard for me to see that in a way that mm -hmm. I think it is hard for uh, white guys to understand their level of privilege if because they're focused on some way in which things aren't working for them. They don't see all the ways in which they are working for them. But I still, I mean, people will, you know, answer, you know, answer my email uh, pretty much, but I know what they're thinking now. I mean, I may be able to get people's attention, but I mean, we're, you know, not shy about putting a stake in the ground about having unconventional, in fact, so Elon Musk, when we, started promoting the book mm -hmm. a month ago on social media and there was a picture of the book and I had my quote which I like to say a lot uh, genius is evenly distributed by zip code but opportunity is not Elon came after me in a big way and so oh. there were, you know four million views you know later and a lot of uh, hate tweets uh, I'm like, isn't that awesome for promotion? Or am I missing the point? <laughs> I don't, I, to, to be honest, I, I wish it were, but I, I don't think those folks buy books, so. <laughs> fair, 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 fair. And, and okay. Twitter is not the right way to engage in a conversation across people who have different opinions. It's possibly the worst way other than all the other social networks, so. Right, 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 okay. Yeah. It's interesting what you say about this point of privilege. I'll say this as an Indian American woman who grew up working class. I'm now at the point of having plenty of privilege and I have a hard time letting that sink in. So I think it's a very human feature. It's just that white men tend to get more of it over time. Um, so just, I'll, you know, I'll share that, that perspective. In terms of, you know, part of why I was really puzzling over it, and I didn't know how you would answer this question. I, it really has to do with your relationship with Uber. Okay, and you write about this in the book. Early investors in Uber, and early on in the company's life for quite a few years, you worked to help that company grow and grow up more equitably. You did lots of work on all fronts. And I didn't know this detail until I read your book. You were trying to advise Travis Kalanick, the fallen CEO, on his ways through scandals including leading up to and beyond, at least a little bit beyond, you may remember a letter written by a female employee named Susan Fowler. And Susan Fowler, she wrote this explosive letter detailing what her life at Uber was like, including the first week on the job, a male manager basically propositions her for sex and she tells the HR and they're like, oh, he didn't mean it. Right, just brush it under the rug. And you explain in your book that even after that, you were trying to help him get it right. And I was like, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there are uh, two stars in the Uber chapter um, who both took a bunch of risks, um, and they're actually both in the audience tonight. Oh. Bernard and Luis. Um, and I remember you both. Yeah. So we will <laughs> let them speak up when, when they want to, if they want to. Um, but what would happen, and this is actually a real good indicator of Uber culture, it was most often on a Saturday that Emil, who was 
Travis's lieutenant, would call Mitch's cell phone and say, can I speak to your wife? Now, how (laughs) stupid and offensive is that? And how indicative of Uber culture is that? Wow. They they couldn't call your phone. Like he's going to give them permission or, you know, like he decides who I can talk to? Like, really? So Uh anyway, and then we would waste a ridiculous amount of time on Saturday evening talking to them through their latest crisis and what they should do, what they shouldn't do, blah, blah, blah. They would follow exactly none of our advice. Exactly. And then next Saturday, <laughs> they would call. So we'd been through a whole bunch of this. And, and Bernard and Luis, and if there's any other ex-Uber in the room, may remember. I mean, I came in and I did a big presentation to anybody who wanted to come. I was invited by several of the employee resource groups on bias and how you recognize it and all of that. Um, Luis and Bernard were leading a a global employee resource group meeting, um, and I came and I spent a bunch of time. That's a a little bit of that that is in the book. We were trying, I was trying to leverage the people inside Mm -hmm. for whom those jobs mattered and that equity was going to be life-changing and who cared about their teams. Mm -hmm. I was trying to help the people inside Uh, who wanted to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. In that description of what came out or what fell out, there's something that you described that really landed for me, frankly, because of a recent conversation I had with an ethically questionable leader. Um, (laughs) And it was to the effect of loyalty to values trumps loyalty to individuals when their behavior veers off course. It might sound obvious, but it's really not. And actually, I, I, I do want to share the little experience I had that made me like asterisk this part a million times. Um, there's a, a very prominent social entrepreneurial leader who I deeply respect, who's of an underrepresented minority, who I think has one of the most important stories on earth. We've been speaking to each other for many years. He wants to write his memoir. We were talking about the possibility of me helping, to, uh, helping him write it. And I mentioned to him This would be very interesting to me. But just so you know, one thing that I would do as an investigative journalist is go and poke around and make sure that you don't have a questionable relationship with women. Uh, And I don't mean adultery with consensual sex. I'm not the morality police. I mean unconsensual using your power incorrectly kind of thing. And I just kind of assumed that would be fine. And the reaction to (laughs) it. (gasps) The way this person shut down, I was like, wow. (laughs) And therefore, the asterisks on what you said, because it's like, right, loyalty to values trumps loyalty to individuals. And I don't actually think that's an easy lesson. It wasn't, it's not an easy lesson. We took our decision to go public about Uber very seriously. We thought long and hard about who we're going to hurt that we cared most about. That was that was really what we were thinking about. Um, we got very much, and I think you were referring to this before, we got very much ostracized by the other investors. Mm-hmm. But that was not who we were thinking about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of, just one more question about this and then we'll move on. You describe in your book the whisper culture of Silicon Valley, it's what you call it. Do you find it difficult or the answer is yes, you find it difficult, but how do you balance being so outspoken, having such a strong take and the both of you have such a strong take on what's right and wrong with this whisper culture where you need to get get business done? So typically we're approaching other investors because we'd like them to co-invest or we'd like them to invest in the next round of the company. So we have something to talk about, which is the company, the founder, the business model, the progress to date, the issues that we've seen. And that's a, it's not exactly a neutral ground, but it's common ground. Uh, and that then tends to engage them. So, and, and often they say, yes, they're, they're excited about it. And so despite and, and we encourage our uh, entrepreneurs that we've invested in 
to be thoughtful and to ask tough questions when they go to raise more money. So we put our strong opinions, we, we, we talk about uh, what could go wrong if the new investor isn't really committed to the mission. And we counsel entrepreneurs on how to have those conversations. And some of them listen to us, some of them don't. Many of them have come back and said, I wish I had listened to you. I will, will listen <laughs> the next time, which is fine. I mean, I'm, I'm not a one-shot learning person either. And so they're the ones that need to have the tough conversations with the investors. We don't, you know. Uh, need need to have them mm. if they do, and so it's a you know as far as all that goes, it's a kind of a modus uh, vivendi. It's just this sort of yeah. deep clarity on the specific goal that you yeah. want to accomplish. You know, Frida, am I leaving? Do you have a no? And uh, no, on that? I completely agree. And I think again, it it is we are reaching out to people on behalf of our founders, um, and so we're trying to help them and if we believe that somebody will treat them fairly they don't have to have exactly our same values and we try to help as Mitch said help our entrepreneurs we often <coughs> say to people go talk to other founders who've taken money from this investor and see what you think because quite honestly that investor has a mixed reputation mm -hmm. um, and the one thing that we are pretty hardcore about, when somebody comes to us and they've, you know, they've been introduced or not introduced, we, we don't like warm intros, um, but somehow they come to us and we know them to be a person with deeply held values and mission focused and values aligned. And then we see their pitch deck and none of that's in there. Hmm. And we say, wait a second. We thought you cared about diversity. We thought you cared about impact. What? Where is it? And they said, everybody told us to take, take it, it out of our deck. Mm -hmm. And we say, if you take it out of your deck, we are never going to find each other. If you believe this strongly, then you need this to screen investors, whether they're going to back you or whether they're not going to back you when things get tough. Mm -hmm. That's such a challenging uh, and necessary part about building an identity and transforming culture, right? I was thinking about that when you were describing this exact point in the book of, if I were building a startup, my mentality might be a bit more, who can give me money? I need money. <laughs> and I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be too particular. Mm -hmm. But the signaling of, well, what do I stand for? What am I doing this for? And who is the community that stands with me? That's a very hard thing to do when you feel the need to pay your bills and get things done. Right. <laughs> but it's sort of like saying, I really need to be in a relationship and I can't afford to be choosy. I think there- Which <laughs> lots of people do, man. They do, <laughs> to, their, to their everlasting regret. That is true. Uh, uh, been, I should say, we've been married 25 years. I was talking about the other marriages. That I, had. <laughs> I was talking about my learning curve. Third times. Sure. Yeah, third time's a charm. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, it, you have investors. It's a relationship. It's not just about the money. It, it's totally understandable why somebody would feel they, you know, uh, can't be choosy. But at least we try to have a conversation with people so that they can think through their choices and go into things with their, with their eyes open. Wonderful. Let's talk about Health Sherpa for a moment. So I remember the year 2013, again, I just come here, and um, Obamacare went live with the website healthcare.gov, and most of you are old enough to remember this. <laughs> <laughs> totally didn't work. Total, total flop. And I remember being a young new reporter in the Silicon Valley and looking for, well, what's the angle out of here for this tech story? And I found this young Asian American man. I can't remember how I found him, maybe on Twitter, um, uh, Ning Liang. And I went to his office and he was in a completely windowless, sad, fluorescent like lighting room with coffee. He looked like he needed healthcare. I mean, like he, <laughs> he looked hungry, he looked tired. <laughs> He'd been working, working, working. And it turns out that he and his buddies helped to build a company that you invested in. Talk a little bit about Health Sherpa, what it is in the journey and what you've learned from it. Sure. So a as you said, healthcare.gov, the website just didn't work. Um, uh, Health Sherpa, built a simple mobile app that you could sign up for Obamacare in less than five minutes. 
it was a technical tour de force, and it filled this enormous vacuum. Uh, and it has gone on over the years now uh, to power behind the scenes much or most of the sites that uh, you can sign up for the Affordable Care Act, all the different brokerages and, and so on. I, I forget if it, how many millions or tens of millions of people they've, they've helped sign up. They understood that a better solution was possible, and they went and they built it and they put it out there. And um, explicitly, they started this because they wanted people to be able to sign up and to get the health care that the legislation afforded. But if there weren't tools that let you do that, and it met people where they were. You didn't have to have a computer. It worked on mobile. You could do it in five minutes. It didn't take two hours. And so it was, it was just really well done. And we came in at the beginning and, and supported them. Mm -hmm. And what did you learn from them? Well, it's been an interesting journey with them. Um, they're great. One of, and again, it is some of their lived experience. They're two co-founders. Um, and actually, I was just talking to Kat Perez, a, a self-defined... How does she... Uh, Korean. Korean. Korean Jamaican? Uh, Queer. Know. Um, and that is how she defines herself, uh, presents herself. Um, and she grew up low income. And health care matters enormously to her mm -hmm. um, and to her family. And so, again, it is that passion. Early on, she was just, you know, they, because of the very high growth, she was hiring engineers, whoever she could find who had the requisite engineering training. And we've got some CEOs in the room who know what a mistake that can be. Um, and she ended up needing to back way up and hire people who felt passionately about what they were building. Um, that be, having the engineering chops did not make for the company culture that she wanted. That you had to have some lived experience, some empathy, some concern some passion about what you were building and who you were building for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more question before I turn to audience questions, and we're taking questions from the audience on these cards that you can go ahead and write your questions down. I've got some really good ones here, as well as audience questions online. So we have a wonderful woman walking around collecting these cards. Um, in terms of the experiences you've had. I mean, you you each have such a rich background as investors and also as activists in different and other ways uh, in corporate America. It, it just a range of experiences, and you've been at it for decades. What have you each learned about how power works that you didn't know when you started? It's hmm. a great question. Thanks. Um, anybody? <laughs> um, it's daunting. Let me say, I did not expect to be 70 years old and still fighting um, for the same rights I fought for when I was in my 20s. Huh. Uh, that is sobering. And so the way that power digs in um, to protect itself and its own, um, no matter what folks actually, no matter what they say, there's an enormous, <clears throat> excuse me, there's an enormous amount of performative nonsense going on, um, whether, and especially around diversity, uh, and also uh, now around climate. Um, and I think the ease with which people both fall for it and promote it uh, is something that I think we need to work very hard to shine some light on. Hmm. I'm amazed at the amount of inertia. Once people or an institution gathers power, it tends to perpetuate itself. Who was it that said uh, power or something doesn't concede nothing without a struggle? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who said that? I, <laughs> Somebody can look it up. Yeah, we'll, we'll look it up. yeah so change is hard because the incumbents take every advantage of the incumbency 
to make it difficult for newcomers to uh, come in. And so, I mean, I grew up on, you know, disruptive innovation, which, which has its place. But now that, you know, there's six billion people with, with smartphones and that the, that the installed base of the major social, you know, medias are, 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 are in the billions, what I've learned is that that power is not <coughs> going to go away, you know, quickly or anytime soon. Mm -hmm. It will require a sustained effort on the part of people who want change. Mm -hmm. I think we have to think not in terms of days, months, you know, or years, but decades. These sound like remarkably similar lessons mm -hmm. that you said. Interesting. All right, a few audience questions. I'm going to start with one that I consider among the more playful. <laughs> I'm curious, do you know Ben and Felicia Horowitz, and how is your investment model different or similar to theirs? Also, do you couples hang out together? Can I join you? <laughs> <laughs> um, only, we know Ben and Felicia only very tangentially, although Ben did start his career at Lotus, the company that I founded, but it was after, it was after I've gone. I mean, Ben Horowitz is the um, uh, Horowitz of Andreessen Horowitz, and so they are at the opposite end of the spectrum of having hundreds of billions under management of trying to be a major player in every sector. He, ben is not the, uh, the, the ideologue. His partner, Mark Andreessen, is. And we are actually our co-investors in, 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 you know, in a few things. But I think they would look very much askance at the idea that uh, gap-closing investments are a good idea or even, even possible. Mm -hmm. And so, no, don't, don't hang out. You don't have to hang out. No. Okay. <laughs> no. Did you want to add to that? Well, let me just give an example. When I said performative nonsense, um, ah. here you've got a multi-billion dollar fund. And after George Floyd is murdered, they stand up a $10 million fund for black entrepreneurs. So a rounding error. You could lose every penny of that and it would make no dent in anything about who they are or how they do their business. So I should say, Ben, to my understanding, not knowing him personally, but has a lot of black friends. Uh, and his and, no, 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 and no. celebrity friends. Felicia is black. His Felicia's wife is black. black. And, and he has, no, he has a genuine interest in, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be purely descriptive here. Mm. All I was trying to say is that that sort of social life and his engagement, and he may have uh, genuine feelings about the historical, uh, you know, m mistreatment. All of that is completely different than whether your portfolio is designed to reflect the diversity of talent that exists in this country and in the world. Two very different things that are sometimes confused. So all I'm trying to do is unconfuse them. When, and he does. They Pre-pandemic, they were hosting a lot of gatherings mm -hmm. for black entrepreneurs and black investors at their offices. Mm -hmm. you know, and again, it's exactly what Silicon Valley Bank did. One part of that bank, yeah sponsored women entrepreneurs this is and that's and black entrepreneurs this is and that's and how they treated black and latinx founders who brought money to their bank was kind of different meaning meaning and we have some of our founders have had a good experience there and many have not uh, so we have a company and i can say this because we have more than one company with two black women co-founders, so you don't know who I'm talking about. I'm proud to say. Uh, one of those companies had $7 million at Silicon Valley Bank, all of it in one non-interest bearing account. Nobody who has a real banking relationship manager would ever let you do that. That is exploitation mm -hmm. uh, to a huge degree. Um, and that was not an uncommon kind of, of experience at Silicon Valley Bank. Very clarifying. Another question about employees and culture. In the book, you mentioned that companies that build an inclusive and employee-centered culture often suffer from employees getting a sense of entitlement. I remember reading that too. I was like, oh, interesting. Can you help founders navigate that? What's your number one tip? 
And maybe this, explain also a little bit about that claim. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it is a very uh, fine line to walk, which is to say that everybody needs to be treated with respect and dignity, um, that you know, putting generous uh, benefits in place, helping people with their student loan debt, for instance, a benefit that we offer. Um, it's a very fine line between that and then saying, well, I get only to do what I want to do. I don't get, I don't have to do everything in my job description because I don't want to. And so understanding where the line is between what we need you to do and and how we think you deserve to be treated. And I'll give you an example of partly where that line came from. And this was at Lotus in the, in the early days. We started an, an either anonymous or confidential employee suggestion system. And one of the engineers wrote in and said, um, it takes, you know, it's too much trouble and parking's too much of a hassle. So why doesn't Lotus provide us a shuttle to take us to any Boston area restaurant we want to for lunch? First I, world problems. Yes. <laughs> so I consider that entitlement. Uh -huh. well, let me say that a way that we help founders is to have conversations with them, reminding them of the importance that it's the work that's central. And that is what the business is about. It is about the work which accomplishes the mission, which is going to help make people better, be better off. And that is something that needs to remain front and center for employees. If they're mm -hmm. not there to help in that mission, then it's not a place that they should be. Right. And that, and you know, and the problem is, there's no cookbook. There's that formula that can tell you how to resolve the tension mm -hmm. between uh, treating people well and with respect mm -hmm. uh, and you know, getting the right amount of work done. It's a it's a constant act of leadership artistry to figure out how to do that. So maybe it's not a number one tip, but yeah. remembering that we all have to be here for the mission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. This is it's, I would just add, it is much easier to do that in a mission-focused company. Yeah. It's like, wait a second, every time you are taking more resources for you, we're taking it away from the low-income families who need this education help, who need this health care, who need these financial services. Healing to the values of mm -hmm. the people on your team. A question for Mitch. You were so young when you started Lotus in an era with few women in the VC world. So why did you develop this empathetic approach of yours? Well, I think the formative experience for me growing up was very much as an outsider, and I did not like it. I used to joke when I had my stand-up comedy act that I was the least popular child uh, to ever go through the Freeport, Long Island public schools. But that was actually, this is kind of comedy was the last thing I did before I got into, in, in, into personal computers. So um, that, I think, was the basis of just always feeling like an outsider that helped me to identify with other people who were outsiders. And I really give Frida a lot of credit for helping me understand the ways in which our society has systematically relegated entire groups of people to be uh, uh, outsiders, to be less than. Mm -hmm. And so, but it all draws on, you know, my early life experience. And, you know, I have a lot, logged a lot of miles in therapy to help sort that out so that I could, you know, be effective. Mm -hmm. Here's a question about AI. We have not talked about AI at all. And this is a great question. Can you share your thoughts on how AI will deepen the gaps you're concerned about and what can be done to address this? Sure. So I think technology isn't inherently good or bad, but how it is used and developed by people really matters and what people's values are mm -hmm. in, uh, in doing that development. And in these new AI developments, which I think are e extraordinarily powerful, um, they will be used uh, uh, for good and for ill. And my concern is that in the headlong rush to commercialize all of this AI, 
to uh, use it to replace people wherever possible, too many shortcuts are going to be taken. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning, and there's going to be... Like, what's a gap-widening example? Well, a gap-widening... Well, well, they just had another story about a black man who was put in, spent another week uh, or more uh, in jail because the facial recognition technology mm. uh, misidentified him. He had never even been in the state in which the crime was uh, committed. That can happen because the training data that's used for these systems doesn't do a good job with people with darker skin color, and that's known. But that doesn't stop people from deploying it. It's not <coughs> stopping uh, government and police agencies from being uh, con you know, consumers of this technology. And then it'll get into you know, medical and who's gonna be denied insurance coverage, and it will mm -hmm. get, so, and there's a total lack of transparency among the big AI players, OpenAI and others, about what's in their, their training set. So it can't be mm. looked at and examined. And that's why some people have put up their hand to say, stop, we need to have a pause here. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and uh, uh, let me say one more thing. I was around in a small part of the beginning of the internet. Uh, I co-founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation, mm -hmm. Civil Liberties wonderful thing. But we were not thinking at the time about all the bad things that people would do with the internet. We didn't know about phishing and identity theft and all the different varieties of cybercrime and doxing and you know all of that because we were naive and we just saw the optimistic side. Mm -hmm. I don't see how anybody who went through that experience, which is totally sobering to see what a mixed bag the internet is, can look at AI and say, everything is going to be fine. No, everything is not going to be fine. Willful denial, right. Did you want to add something? Well, very quickly, there are a number of groups, most of which led by black women, that are black women computer scientists that are focused on AI for good and countering AI bias. And so on our philanthropy side, we are backing some of those institutes. Right, right. I think that we have time for one more quick question. Actually, then one for me. So quickly, name a company that you respect and who you think really does it right. Um, will all of the k Capital entrepreneurs <laughs> stand up? <laughs> really? Lisa, Phaedra, <laughs> Aileen, Davida. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And this wasn't the question, but if you were to name one that you did not fund. Oh. <laughs> Just curious. Uh -huh. Good question. I don't know. I think we admire particular initiatives that certain companies have undertaken where they have done really well. Well, we admire Generation Investment Management which is the investment firm started 20 years ago by Al Gore and David Blood, who used to be at Goldman Sachs, a real pioneer, inspirational to us in advancing a notion of sustainable capitalism, in talking about how businesses and investors ought to be dealing with uh, uh, the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And they were doing this in the wilderness for a decade and a half before anyone would take them seriously. And they were, they were persistent. They were rigorous in their research, and they had principles by which they invested, and they made a lot of money. And this is in, uh, you know, public uh, global public equities. And so, mm. uh, I would hold up Generation as you know, as an example. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So we have time for my final question. Okay. Before we end this evening together. Can each of you tell me when you realized you were in love with the other? <laughs> <laughs> So Go I, first. <laughs> Please. This is a great story. I was always very fond of Frida back in the Lotus days. I was married to somebody else, and I was very well behaved, and, which was good because Frida co-founded the first group in the U.S. on sexual harassment. So it was just, well, <laughs> I did not hit on her. A dozen years later, in the 90s, life circumstances changed. Frida was unattached. I had just gotten separated. And... Um, she came to me for business advice, as many ex-Lotus 
people did. But I saw an opening. <laughs> <laughs> I did, at, in the first lunch, I didn't do anything. But I was a basket case because this divorce, separation divorce was really horrible. She sent me a sympathy note on a card. And I interpreted her supportive note as saying that if I asked her out, she'd say yes. So <laughs> I called her up immediately. <laughs> and and, and I, what I said was, 12 years ago, I did not have the opportunity to do this. Life does not give you second chances all that often, so I am taking mine. And that's mm. when I started to know. Oh, that's right then oh, then. good line. Mm. So right then you felt, wow. Yeah, because I kind of knew it back then, but I couldn't do anything about it. Oh a dozen years before so mm. sometimes it's entrepreneurial you know when the opportunity <laughs> is there you, you, you gotta take it but. well on our second date i told him i was not stepmom material <laughs> 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 he had two kids eight and ten um so obviously he didn't believe me um well so there are two parts also it is we work together very closely um, he was adored by every Lotus employee, and he was still practicing his stand-up at the staff meetings, um, and everybody had to laugh because we were his employees, right? <laughs> but some of the stuff was pretty funny. Um, so there was a certain kind of admiration and fondness that I had for him back then that probably everybody else at Lotus did. But then it was, it was this 12 years later um, when we're having lunch, and it's a very, I'll do it very quickly. I know we're out of time. So I was serving as an expert witness. I was testifying against the Teamsters, talk about hmm. risk taking, hmm. um, oh, wow. in a race and sex discrimination case in Kansas City. And I got stuck in thunderstorms coming back and I was supposed to have lunch with him and I'd slept like an hour and a half. And I decided, okay, I'm not gonna cancel. I'll, I'll go meet him. Um, and, um, it, over lunch, he said, do you remember when I told you that if I wasn't married, you're somebody I'd be interested in? And it was like a light bulb moment. And so you felt it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Mitch Kapor and Frida Kapor Kai, and really have enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks all for joining us thank again. Thank you. CommonwealthClub.org for more events. And stay around afterwards for book signing. We'll be signing books out in the lobby. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Art.